want to thank all of our candidates. We have uh, you know, existing state senator on, on the call right now, Judy Schwank, and then we have a number of candidates who we'll be introducing. who don't know me, I'm Christine Jacobs. I'm the Executive Director of Represent PA. Um, we are the PAC in Pennsylvania that works statewide to elect progressive women to the state legislature, both the House and the Senate, with the idea of turning them both blue. And we go through a long process. Most of you are aware, the candidates certainly know, that we ask you to fill in questionnaires. We evaluate the questionnaires on your progressive values and what you're going to work on. And we're fully convinced that all of these women will really can really make a change in Harrisburg and bring us a government we need. Um, so that's represent PA. What I want to do is just thank you all for coming and let me give you an idea of who you're going to meet and then we're going to have a panel discussion which will be led by a, a journalist and then we'll take questions from the audience. As you have questions, feel free to put them into the chat and we will make sure we get to them. We, ha we held one of these sessions a couple weeks ago and, um, and it's just fun listening to the candidates talk about what's important to them. I got teary during this session, I have to tell you, um, because it just reminds me of all the work we're doing. I'm exceedingly proud that we've supported 54 candidates in House and Senate races. Many of them are um, incumbents, but many are brand new candidates since the first time they've ever run for office. Um, and some are candidates who ran last time and uh, are giving it a go again. I'm speaking to you, Michelle Noel. Um, we, this year, we've invested $500,000 in candidates for Senate and House. Do you know, two years ago, we did 200,000. But this is a measure both of our, our reach. Um, we've learned how to do webinars to gather candidates from across, the, uh, to gather uh, funders from across the state. It's, um, we don't just talk about turning PA blue. We, you saw that the, the video we just did, we talk about important issues. And we've talked about issues that are important across the Commonwealth and really help people to understand that this isn't just a my party versus your party. This is a matter of people and, and rights and um, what kind of Commonwealth we wanna have for ourselves and our families. Our candidates represent uh, 25 counties with 15 predominantly red counties, five purple and five blue. Uh, but 25 counties from across the state. Um, we all know that in part of our discussion with people about why it's important to have a statewide reach and why we exist as a PAC is that I, I live in Philadelphia County. I will always be represented by a Democrat. It's just the way it works. But if we wanna have a say in what happens in Harrisburg, if we wanna make sure that the Commonwealth is in good shape for our whole county, for, a whole, for all of us, we have to work together. We provide a community for our women candidates and the culture of trust. We, in some of our breakfast briefings, had some just great stories listening to what happened to some of our candidates out on the trail and letting them know that we're here for them. We really believe in these women and you're gonna to get to hear from some of them tonight. And now let's meet the candidates that we have on today's call. I mentioned Judy Schwenk, who's uh, in the bottom left of this. Judy Schwenk has been a, um, a state senator and uh, she's now a member of leadership. Um, up until recently, we didn't have enough women in the Democratic caucus on the Senate side for um, the powers that be to decide that women should have a, a leadership role. And we're very proud of Judy in that role. And now what we're hoping for is after this election, we'll be able to move the uh, state Senate, the Democratic caucus, First, we're working, looking for a majority or at least a tie with four um, 
and a majority with five wins. And uh, we're looking to have the, the caucus be 40% women. And uh, Judy Schwenk knows that'll be a big difference from when she started. Our other Senate candidates who are on here are Michelle Siegel, who's running from uh, Northumberland and Luzerne counties. Um, Janet Diaz, who's running from uh, Lancaster County. And uh, Julie Slomsky, who's running from uh, Erie County. And Shanna Danielson from Cumberland and York County. Incredibly strong, capable women that you'll enjoy hearing from. We also have state house candidates on this call. Um, I don't know if Emily Skopov has joined us. Um, Emily, we supported in the last cycle and uh, when she ran against uh, he who was the speaker at the time, Mike Terzai, and now we've supported her in this election after he's resigned. We say that Emily scared him off. Uh, Jess Benham, who had a pretty tough um, primary in uh, Allegheny County, but uh, we're looking forward to having her join the caucus. Nicole Miller from Cumberland County, another strong candidate. Michelle Noel, I mentioned earlier um, that Michelle ran last cycle and decided to take another plunge at it, and we've heard her campaign is going really well. And finally, Tara Zerinsky from Northampton County, a tough county to run in, but Tara's got a great background and is a strong leader in the environment and in things that really need to change in Pennsylvania. And these are the people you're here from tonight. And now tonight's moderator. We're pleased to have Lucy Noland, who's, who's a, a journalist. She's worked on in TV on a number of different areas and has a, a very strong focus in, in areas that believe in us. Uh, she has, um, and so she moderated our panel uh, a few weeks ago, and we're really happy to have her back tonight. She's been able to talk to some of our candidates to get an idea of where they are, and she's just going to lead a discussion with them for the next uh, 45 minutes or so, and then we'll work in some of the questions that you all have by looking at our chat. And by the way, in the chat, if you're drinking something good, let us know what it is. Heidi's already uh, shared her, her drink of choice for tonight. But now I turn it over to Lucy Nolan. Thank you, Lucy. Well, Christine, it's just such an honor to be here. Thank you so much. It's, it's of course crunch time. You know this work in the, the hotline for the Dems. One final day, early voting. It's tomorrow, everybody. Christine, what did you say the most important thing is? vote. That's exactly right. So thank you to all the candidates for joining us. Um, I know how crazy busy your schedule is. For all of you voting constituents, I know that you're probably slammed just as busy as well. So thank you for joining us. Um, off the bat, we wanted to introduce our candidates in a, in a different way versus just, you know, where, where did you grow up and what school did you go to? So we thought, what better way to make it a little more personal than to ask each candidate what individual quality about them, what unique thing about them, you could say your superpower that you bring to Harrisburg to better represent your constituents. So to do this, let's take it alphabetically. We've got 10 candidates, a lot of folks. Jessica Benham, why don't you kick things off for us? Wonderful, thank you so much. You know, I love this question. Uh, when you told me you were gonna ask it, I, I just think it's great. And for me, you know, I think that my unique life experience as somebody with a pre-existing condition, particularly I'm an autistic person and then I also have a rare disorder called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. And also as a member of the LGBTQ community, uh, these are perspectives we are sorely lacking in Harrisburg. I often say that we legislate from our lived experience. And so growing up in this world as a queer disabled kid who's always felt on the outside, I know that I'm not gonna feel like I belong in Harrisburg. And I don't think many of my constituents feel comfortable in the halls of power either. And so my hope for my future constituents is that they see themselves reflected in me and that I'm able to take that fighting spirit to Harrisburg on their behalf. Jessica, thank you so much. Janet Diaz. Well, thank you um, for the invitation and um, Christine Jacobs. Uh, woo -woo. <laughs> Um, I really appreciate um, what you've done. Um, I think Represent PA believed in me and I, you know, killed the primary and let's hope we can kill the general. <laughs> um, I feel that my strong point would be in healthcare. I've been in the healthcare industry 18 years. I have been able to navigate um, the industry so well that I think I would bore you to death, but I've worked in the health insurance, 
for three years. I also manage a practice of five physicians as a billing manager. And currently I am a medical analyst uh, for the stroke neurology department at Lancaster General Health. Most importantly for me is the fact that we have practically almost 100,000 of our constituents without health care. I just knocked on doors yesterday in the rain and in just one block in that period of time, I found five, uh, three families in one block without health care. That's including children. So we need to make some changes. We need to um, bring in um, what I've already started working on is a basic health plan, just like Minnesota and New York. I think this is the way we can start um, to at least make sure that they have the basic needs to go see a doctor when they're not feeling well. All right, Janet, thank you so much. Shanna Danielson. Thank you for the invitation to participate tonight. Um, I have been thinking about this since we talked last week and I was like, oh, geez, the one thing. And then listening to my campaign manager and also my family, um, my mom was just here visiting to kind of help out a little bit. And, and she said, some things never change. And since the time you were a kid, you have just been tenacious. You just don't have an off switch. You just don't stop. Um, and so when I'm sitting here until 1130, writing thank you cards and then dragging myself upstairs to wake up in the morning and, and run all over again, like I know so many of us are doing, that's what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about how much more effective our legislature is going to be when there are women who know how to get things done and who don't stop until the problems are solved. Um, and, and so that's what kind of keeps me going through these last couple of days, um, although who knows how long it'll be before we actually have results. Um, but it's just that tenacity and that knowing, you know, all the things we need to do for our communities and the reasons why we're all running will only be done by people like us who are going to go to Harrisburg to actually, I don't know, do the job people are sending us there to do instead of just like waving the partisan flag and being useless. I'm not saying they're useless, but I'm saying a lot of them are kind of useless. So we would like to have them find new jobs and we would like to actually fix problems. Um, and so I think that's what's going to make the difference. And it's going to take a lot of energy. Yes. All right. Thank you very much, Shanna. Michelle Knoll. Um, I think that uh, the quality that I take to Harrisburg uh, will be being an educator who works with very young children with delays and disabilities and Pennsylvania's model has us going into homes to work with those children. And so I have a unique perspective. I actually have been in homes and seen the things that families are struggling with. And I've been in almost every dis, uh, municipality. I have 13 municipalities in my district. I've been in almost every municipality uh, with families working with their children uh, with disabilities and delays. And I see them when they're struggling with uh, the threat of homelessness or food insecurity or just um, the prospect of having a child with a profound disability. And so that gives me a unique perspective on what people are interested in and, and, and the struggles that they have. So that will be the thing that I think will be unique um, that I take to Harrisburg. All right, thank you very much, Michelle. Nicole Miller. Thank you so much. Thanks for presenting for the support and for having us on tonight. Um, what I bring to Harrisburg, um, well, I bring the fact that um, I, a lot like Shanna, don't give up, right? I uh, lost my son and I got back up and here we are fighting because this is too important and there's, there are many lives on the line. Um, my son was of mixed race, my dad is in law enforcement. So I kind of stand in this middle ground where we need to change some things for sure and stop what's happening um, with the brutality we're seeing. And um, I just don't give up, I fight. I learn, I fight, and we know how critical it is right now for our kids out there and the families out there that are struggling to find mental health supports or um, just the resources that they need within the community. So what do I bring? The fact that I will never give up and I will fight for every single child in this, uh, in the Commonwealth because I know, I know what value they hold. Surviving battles make us so much stronger. Nicole, thank you so much. Uh, Judy Schwank. Hello, everyone. Um, and I, too, have to thank Represent. To hear you say, Christine, that there's a community there for us. When I, I think all of my colleagues here will say, when you're out there and you're reading nasty comments on Facebook about yourself, it's really <laughs> nice to know there's somebody who at least thinks you've got something going on right. Um, 
You know, yeah, this, I am a sitting legislator. Um, I was elected in a special election. So um, this, um, you know, I, I don't think of myself as a career politician. It, it's been nine years in the state Senate, but I also served as a county commissioner. I've been a teacher. I was a county agriculture agent, um, also a dean of a college of Delaware Valley uh, College in agriculture and environmental sciences. So what do I bring? I'd say that I like to be the person that people listen to. In caucus, for example, I may start the conversation. You know how it's awkward and everybody's sitting there and you need to talk about something and nobody does? I'll start it. I'll get it started. But then I also like to be the one that fish, finishes and the voice that's listened to. So I, you know, I try to be uh, strategic in terms of the work that I do. I like to say I'm a connector too that after so many years of experience doing things, I know a lot of people in this community and I, I know where to put things together that help improve people's lives. It could be business opportunities. It could be connecting someone to um, you know, access to services that they absolutely have. Um, I love the constituent service part of this and um, which is a good thing because we don't often get a chance to pass legislation from the democratic side. I mean, it's, it's abysmal, it truly is. So I'm good at finding out where I can be of most help and um, getting it done. I get stuff done. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Schwenk, we appreciate it. Michelle Siegel. Hi everyone, thank you so much for, for having me here. Um, so what I can bring to the table is somebody that's lived the life of every rural person I've had to go on Medicaid as when I was younger because my parents' private insurance would not pay for a surgery for me, so I had to become independent and have Medicaid for two years. I've, I have an Earth and Environmental Science BS. We are third worst, as that video said, in water, and my family died from it. My uncle died at, in his early 50s in central Pennsylvania because our family's well was polluted by an unlined coal ash pit. And this legacy pollution is all over central Pennsylvania and we do not talk about it. And it, it's so bad that this coal ash pit that in this area has a fence around it, has a sign that says you cannot fly over it, but yet Black Hawk helicopters are flying over it constantly taking readings. This, it's, it's unacceptable. And our legislature has continued to ignore this problem. They had to change where the bypass was going in this area because the ground under it is a milkshake consistency. And nobody should have to bury their child. And I watched my grandparents bury their son. He was a mechanic. He fell through the cracks of our healthcare system. His colitis turned into cancer and he died. I can bring a real rural voice to Pennsylvania, to the legislature, so that we get government back to of, by, and for the people. Because that's what our founders intended. That's what America was built on. We are Pennsylvania. This is where this country was founded. We need to start being a leader and not a lagger anymore. So that's what I want to bring. Thank you. Yeah, Michelle, these real world experiences definitely need to be heard in the uh, halls of the Capitol. Thank you so much, Michelle. Emily Skopoff, have you joined us? Thank you guys so much, and uh, I apologize for being late. I had a constituent that was, um, or hopefully a future constituent, so um, that was, I give out my phone number. Maybe that's my unique quality, but I give out my cell phone number. It is on yard signs all over the district, um, and it goes on everything, so I got a call right before this and just could not get off, but um, thank you so much for having this, and thank you so much for the unbelievable support that um, Represent has given me even when you know many Democrats wouldn't even return my call. So, so thank you for having been there this whole time and really taken a serious leap of faith with me. And I, I think about that all the time. Um, I wanna say, I think probably the thing that makes me somewhat uniquely qualified, although listening to these women talk, I feel like 
probably a lot of us share a lot of these same things, like the, the fighter and the tenacity and all of those things. Um, I think the thing that most often I'm criticized for is the thing that makes me in some ways uniquely qualified in this district, which is my history having worked in the film industry, um, where I was also an outsider. I went there not knowing anybody in a business that is really known for its nepotism, um, not having connections, not having wealth. Um, I just used my sort of superpower of just trying to outwork all the men, yet another male dominated industry. Uh, this was a time when there was no Me Too yet. There was just, you know, you had to figure out how to swim among the sharks and survive. Um, and I managed to do that. So I managed to not only, you know, achieve success in a male dominated and incredibly corrupt industry, where also money and power is, is as unfortunately influential as it is in politics. Um, but also I was able to work with enormous crews of people and get them to come to a consensus. Um, so when you're working with people as a writer or a director or a producer and you have lots of people with money, lots of people with power, lots of people who have a right to a say, and how do you get those people to form a coherent, cohesive vision and the narrative to move forward? To me, that sounds a lot like legislating the future of Pennsylvania and writing policies where you take in so many different perspectives and needs and concerns and have to still come up with policies that really can address the majority of people and, and improve their lives. So um, I somehow seemed adept at really working with people from all over and getting them to a table hearing them out and finding a way to move forward and building consensus. So um, I think that's something that served me really well in, you know, in Hollywood um, and in the film industry. And I believe that it's really going to make me um, equipped for whatever comes should we win uh, on election day to be able to work with people on both sides of the aisle and reach consensus and compromise. And I know it won't be easy, but I do know that it's possible. So thank you again for having me because you've done it. All right, thank you very much, Emily, appreciate it. Uh, Julie Slomsky. Thank you, Lucy. And thank you to everyone here at, at Represent. I don't know what I would do without you. I'm, I'm so thankful for your investment in me in the primary and, and here in the general, the, these you know, just the true investment, the true support means the world to me. And I, I see my buddy Rebecca from Emerge on there as well. And, and we're lucky to have supporters such as Emerge with us every step of the way and have several of my Emerge sisters here uh, you know, with us this evening. Just honored to be a part of this group of so many strong women uh, looking to, of course, you know, uh, make a difference in, in Harrisburg. And, you know, Lucy, when you talked about superpowers, I, you know, my, I think one of my superpowers is my use of the F word, but I'm, I'm really being careful uh, on that. Uh, but, but, but my superpower, honestly, I think it's my ability to, to shoot straight. Um, right now, I'm in a, I'm in a battle here. Um, I took an unpopular stance on, on charging to state parks, and, and my opponent has came after me heavy on that. And it's been a, been a, been a battle, been a battle, and it's every single door, every single conversation. I apologize for my look right now, but uh, just got off some rainy doors, and that's still been the, the topic of conversation. So it's been a, it's been a heavyweight battle, as people are saying. I'm, I'm swinging every day on the topic, but politically, was it the smartest thing to do? No. But to shoot straight, that's what I have to do. And, and that's where I believe I'll be that leader and that champion for this region in Harrisburg. And I, I, I tease my, my hope to be uh, future colleagues that are uh, all male here in, in, in Erie County. And I remind them every day that, again, I'm not going to take the popular stance. I'm going to take the stance that's right. And we have to shoot straight for our constituents. We owe it to them. And if it if it's, you know only gets me in for one term, then it is what it is. But to me, you I think uh, we see it with all these women here on, on this conversation here this evening is you have to shoot straight and you have to do what's right when it's all said and done. It may not be popular, but you know, I, I wasn't raised that way. I was raised to, you know, again, put my best foot forward and stick up for everyone, no matter what the situation is and, and get those results. So I think that would be my superpower is just shooting straight, no matter what the consequences are standing up for people. Most importantly. Well, as my grandpa always said, honesty is the best policy. All right. got it. <laughs> Thank you very <laughs> Thank much, you. Julie. Um, Tara Zrinsky. Hi, how are you doing? Uh, thank you for having me here. I uh, want to express how grateful I am to represent PA for your support in the primary and uh, this part of the election in the general. Uh, I would say that my superpower is definitely coalition building. I've had to recreate myself several times in my life. Uh, now I am a single mother and politician, educator, solar energy consultant. And throughout my career, I've always felt that what I have been able to do best is connect people, uh, especially meeting people through my own stories, my own narratives, and finding out how we are the same. And 
not just connecting on that emotional level, but finding out how we can connect on a mission. As the Director of Lifespan Faith Development at the Unitarian Universalist Church, uh, I created missions and visions to take our uh, education programs. As a Northampton County Councilwoman, I have taken our council and used that mission and vision building to build a coalition around environmental issues. And that kind of shadows um, everything that I've done as a Food and Water Watch local coordinator previously in building a coalition around the Penny's Pipeline. And so I feel when I go to Harrisburg, my abilities will be to connect with people, to bring the humanity out in them and connect us on issues that are important to everybody, regardless of a D and R or, or whatever behind your name. And I think that's an important uh, power to have as we go forward because uh, you can't get anything done if uh, you're continually polarized. Absolutely. All right, Tara, thank you so much. And, and everybody, thank you for your personal reflections. I mean, some of the challenges that we've gone through really do make us stronger and, and for you, better leaders and um, able to connect better with your constituents because of the real world circumstances. Speaking of which, we live in some really strange times right now. Therefore, instead of um, meeting in person at a lovely little soiree, we're doing this Zoom centric thing all over the place all the time. So because of that, it's a little bit cumbersome to do these round tables. So I just want to make sure that all of you candidates realize that you can jump in at any given time. It's really a conversation. We want to hear what you think. If you, if you agree, if you don't agree, if you've got another idea, just go ahead and go for it. Heidi C is going to be on the lookout for you because I can't see everybody here, but Heidi's looking at everybody. So if you want to say something and, and I haven't seen you, just raise your hand and, and she'll definitely uh, let us know and, and you'll be there to be able to talk as well. Um, so on the subject of unprecedented times, here we are. Uh, facing a huge, huge budget deficit projected to be what $5.5 .5 billion and no small part because of the pandemic that we're in the middle of right now. So when the next legislative session starts, we're gonna be probably not just knee deep, but probably neck deep, unfortunately, in this pandemic. And we still have that monster of a budget deficit. So how do we solve the enormous problem? Senator Schwenk, of course, you are my minority chair of the Appropriations Committee. So I thought that maybe you'd be best to kick things off here. I'd be happy to. Thanks, Lucy. Yeah, I, I've learned a lot um, in regards to this deficit. First of all, so everybody understands we all use that $5.5 .5 billion amount, but that's only if we go by what the governor introduced actually on, you know, when he did his budget address. Obviously, the spend is going to be less. The dilemma that we find ourselves in right now is that we still have $1.3 billion left in CARES funding that we have, the Senate Democrats have put, yeah, we put together a whole plan on how that could be spent. We could give money to daycare providers. We could be giving funds to institutions of higher education throughout the Commonwealth, to our K through 12 schools. We could especially, this is really important, our bars and restaurants, they need grants. Loans are just not gonna help people at this point. Plus we could expand the small business grants that have been so successful that you know, we've pushed out about $225 billion on. But the Republicans want to take that 1.3 and plug it into the hole in the budget. And here's what I think is, it's short-sighted. One, because we have seen that some of our uh, tax revenues have started to increase. If we could invest in people, put some money in their pockets, if the feds would somehow be able to pass something that gives, you know, helps to support the unemployment um, checks that people are receiving, we could actually whittle down that deficit by, by making sure the money goes out now and really try to regenerate our economy as it stands. So, you know, that's certainly something that I'm hoping we're able to get done. My sense is from what I hear is what might be somewhere in the middle in terms of using half of that CARES Act funds to fill that budget hole, that black hole, or to put it into people's pockets and actually make something happen. But when we, you know, we have to have a budget by November 30th. This will be the first year in a long time that anybody remembers a signy die session. In other words, a session after we have finished our, um, you know, after the election. 
that we're going to have to have a budget passed for the rest of the fiscal year. You know, fortunately, we flat funded education and a lot of human service programs, but there's a lot that we didn't. There's a lot on the line, mental health services in particular, the ways that we address the opioid crisis. There are so many things that will fall through the cracks if we don't find a way to be able to put a budget together. Right, absolutely. And, and you know, we're going to talk about that CARES Act and the 1.3 billion or so that we've got left out of the almost 4 billion that we got out of it um, in a little bit. And some of these other really um, relevant points that you're talking about, Senator Schwenk. But one of the things I did want to ask you, then we need to jump to everybody else. Sure. You, you've, you've introduced something that can help now and in the future. I mean, you've got to build it out, of course, but the Industrial Hemp Act, it's, it's right. I mean, and you're, you're, you're big into the agriculture realm, of course, as we know as well. So please tell us a little bit about that and what the promise it holds. This is a, a crop that could be amazing for Pennsylvania's farmers. I always have this dream that when I'm driving on the turnpike from Reading to Pittsburgh, instead of just seeing corn and soybeans, I'm gonna see hemp growing. And, you know, and, and, and using that as a crop, not, not only for um, biomass, we can use it for all kinds you know, of everything from insulation in cars and buildings to literally creating plywood out of it. And but cosmetics. Also, oh, I'm sorry? Cosmetics as well. It's, it's yes, all, that's yes. right. Here's the, here's the thing that is right now is most profitable is CBD, which is a derivative of hemp. It is not a, um, a you know, it, it does not create the kind of high that the, the, the plant, the, the other marijuana plant creates, but it does have, you know, some benefits and some um, health benefits. My legislation that I have right now would classify it as a food additive. So it would take it off of the uh, restricted um, use um, list and actually allow us to legally sell it and manufacture it in Pennsylvania. There are people that are doing it now, but they have to be very careful about how they label it or they get in trouble with the FDA. So one, we want to take it off of the uh, noxious weed list, hemp. And the second thing is that we want to make sure that we can position Pennsylvania to be a powerhouse in CBD production and manufacturing and marketing. And the federal farm bill, I think, in 2018 kind of helped lay the platform for that. Now, now Tara Zrinsky, we're going to go from hemp over to recreational marijuana, because you talked to me about promises of both things. Yeah, and I've actually met Senator Schwenk at um, a hemp farm and at the agricultural um, farm show uh, in uh, Harrisburg. So I have a lot of the same interests really in industrial hemp yeah. and the legalization of marijuana because I do see that as a cash crop for Pennsylvania. I know that 80 years ago, it was a cash crop. And now we have the opportunity to see um, the same kind of growth in agriculture that we we should have been having, but that like Kentucky has. Like instead of tobacco, their cash crop is is hemp now. And I think that we can see this in the agricultural in Pennsylvania too. One of the things that I've done in Northampton County is I uh, created an ad hoc committee to explore the, um, in the industrial uses and the development of a supply chain here in Northampton County. And I've talked to lots of farmers about this and they really do want it. They're kind of scared to take the risks. It's still very new but it offers a lot of promise because as uh, Senator Schwenk mentioned, you can make 25,000 different products from industrial hemp. Now the legalization of marijuana is a little bit of a different product because it's not used for materials per se, but the recreational use would be much like the prohibition that was experienced uh, with the legalization of alcohol that, that from the past. We can tax it, we can generate income off of it, and legalizing it has criminal justice uh, ramifications that would help um, take people out of our prisons that should never have been there in the first place. Uh, we have to see this as an equity issue as well. And so I think that these two um, plants together are like the uh, opposite sides of the same coin for us in Pennsylvania. I really believe that our future is hemp and our future is green here. 
Thank you very much, Tara. Now, now, Julie Slomsky, you know your ways around the halls of the Capitol very well, former Chief of Staff for Ryan Bizarro, of course, part of the, uh, the Wolf administration. Do you think that the winds of change, Julie, are blowing right now enough to legalize recreational marijuana? I, I really think so. I, I, I do. And, and, you know, echo what Senator Schwank said, what, what Tara said as well. And, and I, I give kudos to, to my buddy, the Lieutenant Governor, um, for, you know, holding on and, and not letting go. And I, I think that's the key right there. And, and, you know, working across the aisle and having those conversations. I mean, we, like we talked, Lucy, I mean, we're, we're so deep in the hole. I mean, this is not only going to help, you know, you know, fill, fill the, the gap, but it's, it's going to help us overall. And, and Senator Schwank talks about the CBD side. And I, I've talked to so many farmers as well. We don't have as many here in, in Erie County. We have a decent amount that are saying, give us the chance. I mean, this is going to help us in, in so many different ways. So we're, we're way, you know, way behind the ball. I, I kept saying at the beginning of the year, I said, I would love to vote to legalize marijuana. I said, but I have a feeling I'm just not going to be able to do it. It'll be done before I get there. So to me, I, you know, I, I think we, we lock arms, we fight like hell, you know, come, come January to be able to do so because it, it, it is, it's, it's about damn time. And, and I have this, the, the sense just based on conversations I had. And as we see all over social media, the LG is not letting go of it. And I think about, you know, when I, when I travel with him, you know, throughout the Commonwealth and, and we're even in these deep red counties where people are saying the same thing. I mean, it needs to be legalized. I mean, I only did 10 stops with him, but, but you know, one of those stops and just the positivity coming out, doesn't matter if it's a red county or a blue county. I mean, there, there was so much positivity and it's about damn time and be foolish if we just let this go any further. All right, thank Julie, you for giving me a chance to speak on it, Lucy. You know, it's near and dear to my heart. No, I know. I Indeed, we were talking about it earlier. You know, and, and another thing that a lot of you have talked about is the Delaware loophole, where corporations get around paying taxes because they have a shingle over in Delaware. Um, it's something like $670 million a year, somewhere in that neighborhood that the Commonwealth could get back. Now, Michelle Knoll, you've been looking at that and, and, and something called the Racehorse Development Fund, which I know a tiny little bit about because I've been in Harrisburg here and there. But Michelle, a lot of people don't have any idea that these things exist. And you were saying that these are things that could help plug that hole. That's true. The, that what we have is um, this year alone, we have a billion dollars um, loss of revenue to the um, education because of people going to cyber schools. So that will take us back to what uh, Governor Corbett cut 10 years ago. And we have clawed our way back to that billion dollars in 10 years it took us to get back to that. And now it's gone in a heartbeat. The Racehorse Development Fund um, uh, is, is a fund that, that gives people who own horse race, racing, um, horses, thoroughbreds, uh, I, I, I don't know whether it's uh, sulkies, but I know it's flat, flat racing thoroughbreds, um, money to support horse racing in the state of Pennsylvania. So um, when I, as an educator, I'm looking at children, I would like to support children in educational settings instead of race horsing, uh, horse racing. And I feel that um, that, that, that money is, is actually, when you do a little research, you see that it's going mostly out of state to millionaires in other states. Um, a millionaire cup, couple in Kentucky, the heir to the Campbell Soup um, dynasty. So, uh, you know, and someone was quoted in the, um, in an article I read about it saying that their stable would go out of business. Well, that's, you know, they were, would have to put 11 people, you know, they would have to lay off 11 people. And the thing that um, when we look at education in Pennsylvania, we have hundreds of thousands of kids whose zip code is gonna be determining their outcome. And so we can't wait. There's no time to wait for that. And this is a relatively new thing, this Racehorse Development Fund. It came in under Terzai. A lot of people don't know it exists. And we also have, um, those of you in the East have uh, a racetrack that I don't even know. Um, I've never heard of it before, but it's called Park. And we all sort of heard this sensational news about the California um, horse racing um, site. And I think it was in San Jose, but I could be wrong about that. Anita. I think Anita. it was Anita. Anita. Yeah. Many, many horses died. Well, it turns out Park has a worse track record, that's a, I, excuse the pun, for horses dying. And, and horse racing does have, I mean, I had horses as a kid, they weren't certainly thoroughbreds, but horse racing does, it's gambling, first of all, when people don't have any money. So subsidizing gambling instead of subsidizing uh, education is, is um, a problem for me. But also, you know, we know that there's, there are problems with inbreeding with horses and, and using horses that, you know, using drugs to get horses to run when they shouldn't run steroids, those kind of things. So I really think 
that we need to actually just end that racehorse development fund because we need to develop, to develop human beings before we develop race horse racing. And the Delaware loophole is, um, the governor is already working on that. And of course, everything that, um, there are these ideas, I'd like to have the money for education, which is not always gonna happen. But um, many of our fracking entities, the oil and gas industries on this side of the state are registered in the state of Delaware. So we don't get a severance fee. We do get an impact fee, but it's not as um, big as the severance fee would be. And we are getting no corporate taxes for them because they're registered in Delaware. So they are coming here using our resources, polluting our um, streams and um, you know, our air, and we are not holding them accountable for some of that, and we're also not getting any corporate tax money. So there is a model out of South Carolina where the, the, the legislature there was able to prove that Toys R Us, which is now defunct, has a big enough presence to tax them. And I think, for instance, that we could go after some of these people who are claiming a loss in the state of Pennsylvania, um, Target claims no profit in the state of Pennsylvania. They only claim it in Delaware where there's no corporate tax. So we need to hold these people accountable and get some of that tax money for our own needs. And that's a way to raise money. You know, and I, I think that, I mean, there are a lot of those things too. There's the severance fee, there's um, you know, holding charters and cybers accountable. All those things can come together to really start to fund education and, and infrastructure and a lot of other issues that um, we, could, we could address head on instead of, you know, well, of course the CARES Fund, if we release that, that would be also very helpful. But right now we're in a crisis. You know, we are in a $4, million, or $4 billion uh, shortfall or 5.5 billion. So I think those are some good ideas to go after. All right, excellent. And you know, you, you talked about the severance tax, uh, and we're the only major state that is an oil producing, you know, state that doesn't have a severance tax. And it's been a major sticking point in Harrisburg for a very long time now. We have an impact fee. So when somebody drops a well, they, they pay per well, but we don't have that severance tax when they sever the natural resource from the ground. We, we don't have, it could generate a ton of money. Governor Wolf's been trying for, um, for five years. Question is, is 2021 the year, right? Um, now at the last represent PA meeting that we, we did here, meet the, uh, meet the Candidates event. Everybody basically was on board for that. But some folks here have said that they're really not so much on board with the severance tax. And there's some interesting rationale here. But Michelle Siegel, I do want to start with you. You have a BS in Earth and Environmental Sciences. From the environmental side and also the fiscal side, um, what are your thoughts with this uh, severance tax? People that are screwing the state should be paying for it. That's my short answer on this. I mean, I don't know. Uh, it's insanity to me what is going on in, in Harrisburg when I watch this stuff. I, I sit there dumbfounded. We, we continue to pass bills that go to our donors. I call it Terzai's last stand was that nursing home bill that went to UPMC. It is time these people started paying their fair share it is time we stop the corporate welfare in, in Pennsylvania. We should stop subsidizing the fossil fuel industry. That would save a lot of money. I'm tired of my tax dollars going to that. There's a lot of things that we can do here. And why does my opponent yell at me and demand I apologize for trying to tell people that he takes money from corporations? Why is he doing that? Because he's afraid. He is taking money from the fracking needs, taking money from Walmart. He's taking money from, from all these industries and businesses that are just, I call it the Pennsylvania in a group of people that I am friends with, we call it the extraction state. They are taking everything from us and leaving us crumbs and it has to stop. So a, a, a severance tax is, is, is at the minimum needed for this industry. But once again, we're not being honest. Uh, many of these, uh, Pipelines and companies are, are being prosecuted. They're not telling these workers that. I actually talked to a boiler maker. He had no idea. We need to make sure that we're also making sure people have jobs for the future. And I, I, a severance tax, again, it, it's important. We need to do it. But we also need to make sure that they're making sure Pennsylvania is protected, right? You can't, you, severance tax isn't going to fix the environmental problems. Yes, it's going to help with the budget and stuff, but I creep, cr completely agree with Michelle. We, the, the, the Delaware loophole has got to stop. Do you know at Penn State Business School, my husband went, they literally tell you as a business major, 
to apply when you get a business. That's what's going on in Pennsylvania. It, 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 it's, 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 it's wrong to me and it's, it, it has to stop. So yes, a severance tax is the bare minimum to what the, fr <laughs> the fracking industry should be uh, doing to Pennsylvania to, to pay us back because I don't want to bury my child. Well, and, and you, you've, you've lived through these types of impacts with your family, so it's very personal and it's understandable, absolutely. Of course, the reason that we're in this budget crisis, right, is because of COVID-19. I mean, it's, 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 it's everywhere. It's all-consuming. Uh, right now, uh, health looms large because of the Affordable Care Act. It, it could be struck down. It goes before the um, Supreme Court, which as of tonight, I think may be a newly comprised Supreme Court, uh, and that date's November 10th. So uh, we do have something called the penny, which is of course a state run exchange that you're all familiar with. And uh, basically it's supposed to save residents millions of dollars collectively, uh, but a year in, in premiums. However, if the ACA goes down, there are no guarantees as it stands, of course, for the protection of people with pre-existing conditions and a lot of other things. Now, Janet uh, Diaz, uh, you have worked in the healthcare industry for quite some time. And I know that healthcare is your number one priority. In the time of COVID, of course, we do know that studies have shown that brown and black families are far more susceptible to this disease. So how do legislators, J Janet, protect Pennsylvanians? Well, that is correct. Um, the majority of the 72,000 um, that don't have health care in Lancaster County alone, um, District 13 and obviously District 36, it was prior to COVID-19. Now has, it obviously has increased because people have lost their jobs. They can't afford COBRA. COBRA is about, if I, if I recall, it was like 1,200 for just one individual person. So can you imagine having um, two or three children and then yourself having to cover um, these expenses? You're not able to because possibly you're not making those livable wages or you're making minimum wage and then you're trying to pay your mortgage and you're trying to pay your rent. So right now, you know, we can look, it's obvious that we have an issue. We have a problem all across Pennsylvania. Obamacare in some instance was, it was something for people to get, but it was still out of pocket cost was like a thousand, two thousand, three thousand. And I remember running into someone that started working at the hospital with me and she said, well, I have a small business, but the fact is I was paying 50,000 a year just for her family. If we are able to put small businesses together under one umbrella, we should be able to get the same contractual discount as any other corporation. So the out-of-pocket costs won't be so much. And so people would be able to pay a small amount. Not only that, we also should go and make negotiations directly to doctors and to the hospitals because it seems that insurance companies are not listening. They don't hear. When someone can't go to see a doctor, that means that they either have to go to work sick, and if they, how about if they have COVID? They're just going to go into work and just completely, you know, infect everyone else. And then we have, you know, those with pre-existing conditions, whether it's COPD or some type of um, lung disease, it could just bring them to the death. Now, my opponent, obviously, he voted to, you know, get 700 or 800,000 people off of um, insurance because of pre-existing condition. Now, the word is that COVID-19 is going to be considered a disease and it's probably going to fall under a pre-existing condition. We have to stop this. You know, we, we can't continue having people die on us. You know, we, 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 we've lost so many people in the nursing homes. You know, look what New York went through. They couldn't say goodbye to their family. And it's evident that there are plans out there that we can execute just like in New York, Minnesota, where people can all have a same amount of, of you know, out-of-pocket costs that won't be losing their jobs or, or shall I say losing their homes. We have to do something now because COVID-19 has migrated to the point where the expense is getting bigger and bigger and people are not going to the doctor because they're afraid that if they are positive, their cost is gonna be more. Because you can get your test for like $200, but that doesn't mean how you're gonna get your treatment. My sister just passed through the incubation period and she said, I, she basically put me on the will that I would be inheriting a 10 year old child 
I don't have kids, so I can't. I just can't imagine her. She says, Janet, I just felt like I was going to die. And she's a healthy girl, you know. She's a healthy woman, and just to think of what every family is going through. I know my pastor lost his mother-in-law. My friend lost her mother. We have to do something now before it becomes more and more, you know, detrimental to our to our community. And 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 it's a shame that we have to that it had to come to this point for us to realize that some of our legislator on the other side are not looking or caring about our community. And, and that's why you know, I jumped into the race because I know exactly what the negotiations are like. Janet, thank you so much for that. Now, um, Jessica Benham, Janet mentioned the pre-existing condition aspect of COVID-19. And obviously, protecting those with pre-existing conditions, Jessica, is, is one of your main priorities. So in this day and age, with all the additional challenges that we face, how do we accomplish this? You know, other countries don't have these things called pre-existing conditions. It's called your health history. So when we're talking about protecting people with pre-existing conditions, what we're really talking about is protecting everyday humans. You know, the vast majority of Pennsylvanians, the vast majority of people in this country have something that could be considered a pre-existing condition. There is, you know, no agreed upon definition of what a pre-existing condition is because insurance companies like to keep that information of what they're gonna consider that in the dark because it makes it more difficult for people who are seeking coverage to, to get that coverage, to make sure that uh, what they need medically is, is going to be covered. So from my perspective, um, you know, if we lose protections for pre-existing conditions on the federal level, what makes sense to me is that we would protect them on the state level, which other states have done or have proposed to do um, in our country. So we can protect people with pre-existing conditions, we can protect um, coverage for young people, but all of that is a stopgap measure. Now, healthcare is a human right. So if we're going to talk about protecting our access to care, we can't just talk about protections for people with pre-existing conditions. We can't just talk about reducing costs or making healthcare more accessible. We have to talk about how we are going to get to a state and a country where everybody is covered and nobody has to worry about seeking health care um, about what it's going to cost to seek health care. You know, so both as a person with a pre-existing condition, as someone who has done a lot of advocacy work around health care policy, and as, as a human being with compassion and empathy, you know, it's far past time that we put a stop to profit-seeking corporations in the healthcare industry, pretending that they care about us and start holding them accountable for the way that they treat their patients. Thank you, Jessica, very, very much on that. And, and now, Nicole Miller, we, we've seen the mental health tolls that COVID-19 is taking. And on top, that's really on top of challenges that have exist, existed in this realm for far too long. This, of course, is a fight that is, is dear to your heart. What needs to happen to better protect and better help everyone? I think we need to start treating mental health care like the healthcare it is. Um, it shouldn't be a different insurance company that covers your care. Um, we have to increase um, the time you get with your, you know, psychiatrist. A 15 minute appointment is not okay when you're changing medications, when you're, you know, dealing with so much. I know um, with our son, we had to find a private child and adolescent psychiatrist because the waiting list was so long and he was very ill. Um, I had to sell my great grandmother's jewelry to pay for that private um, child and adolescent psychiatrist. But as a parent, I mean, I would sell a kidney. I would sell whatever I had to, to make sure my son had the care that he needed. Um, we do not have enough of them. We do not have enough mental health providers in the Commonwealth, and we need to look into getting people to go into this profession and stay here and work. So student loan incentives um, and, and areas, you know, just looking into that higher education and keeping these people here with student loan incentives. The supports and the resources that are needed in school um, you know, when your kid breaks a leg, some, you know, your friends come with a casserole, 
when your kid is struggling with mental health stability, no one's coming with a casserole. You know, there's a lot of, um, you know, well, if it was, you just discipline more, if you just did this more. And, you know, we really have to get away from that mindset and realize that a lot of our kids are struggling. And if we get those supports from, I mean, early education up, and those resources, we can save so many lives, so many families, and really invest in our future. 70% um, of the juvenile justice system have kids, those kids, 70% of those kids struggle with an undiagnosed or untreated mental health impairment. Um, it's time to give these kids their lives back. It's time to give families the support that they need. And, you know, no one wants to put their, no one wants to outlive their child, that's what I'll say. No one, and you know what? These kids, they deserve they deserve this care. The kids in, in the juvenile justice system deserve this care. They deserve the treatment they need. Um, they're important. They're important just like every other child across the Commonwealth and in our nation, and it's time we fight like hell for them. And they are our future. Nicole Miller, thank you so much on that. Now, we've been talking about the changing Supreme Court. And on that subject, one of the reasons Represent PA is endorsing all of you is because of your pro-choice stance. So how will you protect the Commonwealth, its women, uh, if Roe v. Wade goes down? Emily Skopov, let's begin with you. Well, thank you so much for, for that question. Um, you know, it's funny, I actually had just had this conversation. I think we have a larger pro-life in our district than most folks would think because it is, you know, and an a somewhat, you know, highly educated. It's one of the most highly educated in the region. Um, it's pretty affluent. But, you know, I've been having, I was very grateful. There was a woman that I spoke to today that, you know, to try to talk about what, you know, really what is pro-life. You know, and the idea that so much of what I'm seeing, for example, you know, there's actually a group of nuns who are supporting me, although I am pro-choice. Um, I think we have to start talking about, you know, what is pro-life and what is pro-birth? Um, and also making the case that being, you know, pro-choice is not pro-abortion. You know, we're trying to say that people deserve a choice and I find it always really bizarrely hypocritical when, you know, supposedly some of the, most of the Republicans who are pro-life are so anti-big government. I could not imagine what is more governmental overreach than telling me what to do with my uterus. Like, so really, let's try and understand what is, you know, the hypocrisy there. I think talking about that and also talking about, you know, we're, we're in a place where we're not providing resources where sometimes women feel like this is the only choice. You know, for a lot of women, motherhood or, you know, seeing a pregnancy through is not even remotely viable because the so-called pro-life movement gives no support to women, makes, you know, doesn't enable women who are pregnant, but, you know, let's make sure that they can actually keep a job. Let's make sure that they can continue their education. Where are the resources for pregnant women who want to, make, you know, if, if you're telling them to stay pregnant, what are you doing to, to provide that? And let's make sure, for example, let's focus on contraception. Let's focus on education. Let's focus on prevention. I don't understand the absolute inattention to preventing unwanted, you know, preventing unwanted pregnancy in the first place. And for me, I come at this, you know, as a, in a, I'm certainly from a place where being pro-choice was the majority of people. And now I'm living in a district where I never thought I'd have so many conversations with people who are pro-life. And so I find myself having to say, you know, what are we doing then to, if you're telling a woman to stay pregnant, then where are the resources going to actually have her want to try and do that or believe that that's feasible when you've got too many women in poverty who can't imagine how they could possibly do it? You know, how can they do that? Or can they keep their job? Can they complete school? So we really can't even talk about saying you're going to be pro-life if you're not going to provide people with the resources and they feel like they have no other choices. And I think the other thing is really focusing on prevention and making sure that you know, we can't shy away from having sex education and acknowledging you know, sex exists and young people are gonna have it. And I think it, it has to do with being willing to have conversations that you know, the same people who are ashamed of those conversations are the ones who then want you to keep the baby if you didn't know how you were gonna get pregnant in the first place. We think it's common sense, but there are really huge swaths of people where still they are still a little bit ignorant about the science of how it all works. Um, I still hear you know, rumors and myths from people. So I think let's really make sure that all people have you know, contraception, information, you know, the health services that they need. Sorry, 
my dog gets very passionate about choices. Very <laughs> um, but I think it's, it's really critical that if we're going to have a real conversation about choice, because I think the pro-life movement has given people no choices about anything. Let's talk about resources. And, you know, if a woman still wants to make a choice, let her make it. But you're not even giving, the scales are so weighted against folks who are already struggling and then insisting that they go through with a pregnancy. I think it's really critical that if we're going to talk about this, we need to talk about it being honest about all aspects of it and, you know, reminding people that Planned Parenthood does not exist to provide abortions. It exists to provide health services and to also give women contraception and give them the information they need to prevent unwanted pregnancies. Nobody's really in the business of you know, wanting to go out there and promote pregnancies so they can provide abortions. So I think it's time that we hit back as hard as the pro-life movement has hit back and with as much vehemence and sort of anger and calling out the hypocrisy of their movement for what it is. Um, that's not going to make a lot of friends, but I think we're at a point where, you know, women cannot continue to be assaulted like this uh, and have government making these decisions for us. All right, Emily, thank you very much for that. You know, um, here we are uh, in, in a ravaged economy. They, they, they stimulus bill, it's, you know, back and forth, back and forth, and now it doesn't look like it's going to happen. Uh, Jerome Powell, Fed chair, recently said, too little support would lead to a weak recovery, creating unnecessary hardships for households and businesses. And so here we sit with small businesses on the edge of survival. Other ones completely closed. Uh, Shanna, let's, let's begin with you, Shanna Danielson, on this one. What, what are we going to do to, to help these businesses while we're in the grips of this crippling budget deficit? Sure. We're actually going to spend the money that's sitting there for the purpose of helping these people through this crisis. Um, it is mind-blowing to me to hear that Republicans want to just use it to plug holes in the budget. I mean, I know I'm not there now, but I was under the impression that the money was expressly given to us with the intent of it being used to help people through the pandemic. So, so holding it, like, like putting it in your piggy bank, like just sounds crazy to me. We have people suffering. Um, I always think, you know, first and foremost about industries like bars and restaurants who really shouldn't be open at full capacity if we're trying to, to stop this, um, the spread of this virus, and, but they need help. They shouldn't have to lose their business because something completely out of their control has, has kind of caused this mayhem, you know, worldwide. And so we should be supporting them more of these grants and, and loans and the things that are going to help them pay their bills and keep their employees on payroll. That's what we should be doing. Uh, and then I think about childcare. I know I have a six year old. I know how expensive childcare was. Like, we only have one child because we cannot afford childcare for two, and we're a middle class family. Um, but these centers, so many kids didn't come back after they reopened because their parents aren't comfortable with them being there, because their parents lost their jobs, and so now they're home with the kids. And how can we expect folks to, to be able to go back into the workforce, especially moms, working women? How can we expect them to do that when there's nowhere safe for them to send their children? So those businesses are, are like crying out for this assistance and, and they're just sitting on it. Um, I know that the Democrats are working so hard to, to draw attention to this, to try and get Republicans to move something, but this just really highlights you know we're, it's it's great when we win because we know what work we can do for our districts but the power that will come with us winning for the entire good of the commonwealth is going to be huge i mean just think about what we will be able to move when we're in the majority think about what we'll be able to move and prioritize when there are women and working moms and teachers and nurses and people who've worked in the service industry and you know people who have degrees in science like i can't i cannot tell you how exciting it is to think about passing bills to address these issues with somebody like Michelle Siegel, you know, and somebody like Julie and some, I know Janet had to, had to hop, but we all have such different experiences in so many sectors and so many parts of not only the economy, but really just, you know, human services and this Commonwealth, we know where that money needs to go. 
Um, I'm a teacher. I taught band. Like, what do you think all these districts are going to cut from their budgets when they can't afford to keep teachers on staff? It's going to be the arts. It's going to be theater. It's going to be guidance counselors. It's going to be the things that our schools need the most to help kids through a global crisis. And, and those things are going to be on the chopping block. So we need yeah. to invest that money. We cannot wait another minute. We need to invest that money. We need to help people keep the lights on in their businesses. And we need people getting paychecks. All right. Well, you, you you mentioned education there, Shanna, and 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 by the way, guys, I we absolutely love your passion for these subjects, and we wish we could listen all night long. Sadly, we can't. So we're gonna we're gonna try and keep the answers a little bit shorter uh, for the next couple of ones, if at all possible, because we have a couple more that we want to hit. But Shanna, you were talking about education, which is key. Obviously, broadband is key to not only education but also business and the medical industry. Of course, as you all know, the Commonwealth needs <laughs> needs help, and the, and the Pennsylvania Broadband Investment Incentive Program has only done so much. So, so Tara, Tara Zrinski, you and I talked about this a little bit. Um, in, in, a, in a nutshell type of way, what is your idea for broadband in the Commonwealth? I think we've talked about that in context with a Pennsylvania National or Pennsylvania Infrastructure Bank. I've been an advocate for the National Infrastructure Bank and uh, passed a resolution in Northampton County and also at the County Council. Uh, County Commissioners Association of Pennsylvania and went to Washington DC to introduce a resolution to the National um, Association of County Commissioners. And I think it's so essential to realize that we have debt that we can monetize and we can have really nice things because of it. So by monetizing that debt into bonds and leveraging it, we can create infrastructure projects like the broadband that we need in these rural areas because we know that we don't have enough money to ex exactly do it right now, but we can and we have to in order to allow our education system in the current state to exist. There's such a digital divide right now between the rural communities and the urban and the suburban that we need to close that gap. All right, thank you very much. Um, you were quick. <laughs> I try to be succinct. You asked. I did it. You died. You but and you and you did. So I you caught me off guard though. I was reading one of the chats. <laughs> um, Michelle Siegel, why don't you very quickly also talk about broadband in your area? Yeah. So again, rural broadband is disaster. If we don't start um, also defining it under the federal standard when we write legislation you're actually considering people that have awful up and down speeds, which we do in Pennsylvania fixed. And that's unacceptable because that gets into the whole inequity to going in Pennsylvania in general. So there's little things we can do. I, I, I agree with the legislature when they are working on the red tape to make the fiber optic lines closer on poles because analog wiring and fiber optics are diff completely different pay playing field that needed to be changed. We need an FDR type policy just like we did with electricity to have an inf infrastructure development and get this out to the people. There's no incentive for the farmer in my place that is 20 miles from the town that has to change. This is where government comes in. You form government private partnerships that don't just benefit your donors like Comcast and make sure these small businesses that know how to handle it are actually at the table getting it done. All right, Michelle, thank you very much. Of course, education is key. Broadband is key to that. Pennsylvania has one of the oldest uh, populations in the nation, which I thought was um, interesting. I, I had no idea when I was looking uh, at background on this. So the question, of course, is, is how do we fund our future and keep our great young minds in the Commonwealth to contribute to a greater good for all? Now, Michelle, no, I, of course, lifelong educator. Um, quickly, why don't you start things off? Well, I think uh, making college affordable, we have one of the most um, burdened uh, college graduates uh, groups in the nation. Our college education is very expensive. It's actually cheaper. Um, I think Emily could, uh, knows this. Is, her daughter is at Ohio State. It's actually cheaper to go to Ohio State as an out-of-state student than it is to go to Penn State right now as an in-state student. So we have to look at costs. Um, I am endorsed by APSCUF, which is the union um, that supports the, uh, the faculty at the, our state system of higher learning. But we need to look at also um, giving people a break. You know, in other states, we have um, tuition forgiveness 
for people like nurses and police officers. <clears throat> I think teachers would be a great thing to have uh, forgiveness for healthcare workers, uh, mental health uh, workers, as, as um, Nicole mentioned. I think all these people, if we give them some loan forgiveness, we're going to have people stay in the state as well as uh, be able to have students who are then able to enter the economy earlier, people who can buy houses and buy cars more quickly, they're not going to boost the economy if they can't get a job or if they leave the state. So I think those things are, are, are really critical. Um, and we have to look at the cost of why, why the cost is rising too. I, I mean, I think there are some simple things like when I went to college, if you wanted to work out, you went to the field house, you didn't have a, you know, a gym in, your ba in the basement of your dorm, things like that, or you were an athlete. So, I mean, there are some very simple, obvious things, but I think there's some other expenses. And, um, you know, I went to the University of Pittsburgh, which is a huge research facility. And so a lot of funding goes into the research. So we, we need to look at how we can get nurses and educators and people who want to go into law enforcement in a good, you know, people who are going to arbitrate and negotiate in crises instead of um, leaving the state and going um, elsewhere where you can get tuition forgiveness or you can get a rent forgiveness if you want to live in a, in a more expensive neighborhood. So we need to look at a lot of different alternatives to, to promote people staying in the state. All right, Michelle, thank you very much. Before we get to the lightning round portion here, which is a, a quick question, the same thing for everybody. Does anybody else very quickly want to add to this? Okay, go ahead, Michelle. I just want to say that they cut a nursing loan forgiveness program during the, during the pandemic. So that was a nice thank you to our nurses that have been on the front lines without PPE. So, well, you know, I mean, it, 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 yeah. it goes back to the CARES, you know, to, to the CARES Act, right? I mean, and Senator Schwenk, I mean, you, you, you're on the Appropriations Committee. You watch all of this. You've got your finger on the pulse of what's going on. How do we fix this? In terms of the CARES Act? Well, in, in terms of like what, what Michelle Siegel is talking about, and yeah, the CARES Act, I mean, I, from what I thought, and maybe I was wrong, but I thought that it was absolutely dedicated to not plugging holes in budgets. That originally, that is what it was purposed for, but that has changed since then. Federal guidelines have changed, so it, it can be used for this, unfortunately. But that's the federal government for you. I'm listening to everybody talk, and I'm hearing all the things that you're saying, great programs and wonderful ideas. But none of this happens, ladies, unless we're in the majority. Nothing happens. I've been there, and I can tell you that. I used to talk about bipartisanship, and I always will, because that's the way I roll. But until we get to the point where we have some control over the decisions that are made on that paper that I sit down and you know get to vote on, I have no say as to what's on it. It's the Republicans drive everything. It's very hard to explain that to the public, but you gotta get there. And so, you know, I'm, I'm certainly trying to help you through my donations to my caucus, but we, we've got to make it work somehow. This Early voting here. ends tomorrow. Early voting ends tomorrow. So get yes. out. There. If you haven't done it yet, get out there. If you knock on doors, go with your mask on, socially distance. But let's get, get people to get out and vote. That's the key. I mean, that, that's really the key. And, and Senator Schwenk, thank you for that perspective. Um, so the lightning round. Let's go ahead and do a pie in the sky thing. Um, your pie in the sky legislative dream to bring home to your constituents. We're going to go alphabetically again, just backwards this time. So Tara Zrinsky, uh, in one or two sentences, what do you got? I think the... Uh imperative that we have to get done on day one is a gift ban because nothing's going to get done as long as our legislators are bought and paid for. So gift ban and we have to make sure that this corruption ends. Julie done. Slomsky. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Julie Slomsky. I like it. I like what Tara is saying. I, I'm, I'm in full agreement there coming from the Wolf administration where gift ban is, is all we know. I want to throw one, one other curveball on top of it. It's, a, it's called a Jake Schwab worker safety bill. Uh, it was at basically o OSHA standards, you know, for those that are in, you know, position. I, I, I can go on forever, so I'll watch my words on this one, but this, this young man lost his life because he worked at our local bus company, and unfortunately the bus fell on top of him, and there was no, no OSHA protections at all. And we owe it to his family to pass that that damn bill. Representative Harkins has done his best. It can't move. That's my goal to get to Harrisburg and make sure that happens. Thank you, Lucy. Noble, noble cause, Julie. Thank you. Emily Skopoff. Well, Tara definitely said part of my answer. So as I tell a lot of folks, my legislative, we got to get money out of politics, like across the board in every single way, because the until we do, 
we're not going to get people who are actually there to just do the job who aren't looking to get perks and vacations and feel powerful and feel important. And also the absurd, disgusting amount of money that is going into campaigns um, at a time like this. And God bless, you know, represent for giving us some of that money. But the fact that we are spending more time trying to raise money instead of actually trying to engage with our voters or like that that's a constant tug of war is, is absolutely ridiculous. We need to get the money out because of the undue influence that it plays. It has people in there for all the wrong reasons. Even well-intended people are easily corrupted, unfortunately, it seems time and again. And also let us do the job of meeting with people and hearing what they have to say instead of dialing for dollars. Um, because I don't think it's, it's, it's not good for anyone in, in reality. So my dream would be vanquish the money, period. And as far as dialing, you've got your phone number on all of your on all of your campaign signs, so they can dial to you <laughs> instead. Exactly tell, right. tell you what they want. All right. right, thank you, Emily. Michelle Siegel. Uh, I agree with all these people, but right now, COVID, we need to make sure our workers are protected. My mother is a frontline worker; she's been using the same mask for eight days. She gets in trouble if she gets something on it. We need to make sure that we our small small businesses got the HVAC systems upgraded, and then they could be open more. There's a lot of things that are not happening in COVID and I live in a very red district where our legislators in this area have brainwashed these people so much that they are risking my child's life every day down it. They are playing games with our children's lives and our constituents' lives. We must tackle COVID. Nothing else matters right now because a lot of people are gonna die. I I'm watching the numbers. There's a town in Texas right now, everybody. This hospital capacity is at 20%. One out of five people are in the hospital right now in a town of Texas. So that's where we need to go. We need to do COVID. Yeah, I think El Paso is probably the town you're talking about there. I mean, it's, it's, it's scary. And I mean, we are entering a dark time. And it's, it's amazing to me to think that here we are, what, nine, 10 months into this, and we're still talking about getting PPE to our frontline workers. What is going on? Anyhow, um, Senator Judy Schwenk, what is your pie in the sky legislative dream? I've got two. My big one is, I'm sorry, my big one is to pass the fair funding formula, make it applicable to all education funding. So that whether you live in Philadelphia or you live in um, Dubois, you are receiving the amount of education funding that you should be receiving from the state and increase state investment in education. And my second one, and this is a real, real stretch, but it's very important to me. I have a lot of DACA students in my district, and I want to see them, one, to be able to get this, you know, to be able to qualify for FIA grants so they can go to college. And, they, and it's universal that they can go to any in-state um, Pennsylvania college or university and pay the same tuition rate that the kid that sat next to them in senior class in high school pays. And also, when they get their degrees, that they can be able to teach in our school districts. Right now, you can get an education degree, let's say from Kutztown University, but you can't teach once you have that degree. These are exactly the kids that should be teaching some of our kids in our urban core, my 70% Hispanic city. We, we need these young people to fulfill their dreams. And it's about keeping those young people here fulfilling the dreams yeah. of everybody else, right? Senator Schwenk, thank you so much. Nicole Miller. Um, I want a lot, <laughs> I want a lot. I would like to see um, fully funded schools that are trauma informed, that have the vital resources and supports that we need to take care of our most vulnerable. Um, it, I want to see accessible health care for the people that um, have to cut pills, their medications in half. I want to see everybody be able to, I want to make it so everybody can thrive in their community and feel like they are worthy and welcome and loved. All right. And, and also, Nicole, I just want to say thank you so much for sharing the story of your son. I, I can't imagine how tough that is. So thank you for that. Michelle Knoll. Okay, I would like to say, of course, um, education. I would like to see fully funded, funded education. And I think we can do that at the state level without taxing people at the local level to death. I, I'd like to see that money come from the horse racing development fund, from severance tax, from uh, you know the Delaware loophole, all those things so that people at, at the seniors in my district get a break on their property taxes instead of complaining all the time that they have to pay for education that they're not using so that um, 
You know, I mean, I want everybody to understand how important it is to them, but it doesn't, doesn't always occur to people that everybody should be educated and they should play a part in it. So I'd really like to see us fully fund education. I'd like to see, and I'd like to see those rural districts have the technological connectivity that they deserve to have. Um, we even have it in, in this area, in the Pittsburgh area. We even have some areas that are not, do not have good connectivity. So it's very important to have that connectivity. All right, thank you very much, Michelle. Shanna Danielson. Sure, so also as an educator, um, fair funding formula is huge for me. Um, but because so many folks have already talked about that, I will say I also really want to focus on just, you know, like wages and, and issues that are impacting working families. And so that means raising the minimum wage. That also means, um, you know, affordable college and, and career and technical schools so that people can, can actually live in Pennsylvania and raise their families in Pennsylvania without drowning in student debt for their entire adult lives like I and pretty much every other millennial on earth is, is going to be doing um, because we just haven't been investing enough in, in those education opportunities for folks. All right. Thank you very much, Shanna. And, and Jessica Benham, you can wrap this up for us with your pie in the sky legislative dream. So I think my pie in the sky legislative dream is an economic recovery that works for working Pennsylvanians. And that means you know, so many of the things that we've talked about this evening, everything from support for small businesses to, um, you know, fair tax schemes that, uh, you know, require corporations and the wealthy to, to pay their fair share. And I think, you know, perhaps even, even a bigger lift is, you know, a, an economy and an ethic that views people like me as fully human. And whether I'm talking about myself as a member of the LGBTQ community or as a person with a disability, it is not easy to run for office right now. It's not easy to exist right now in a world where some of my potential future colleagues don't think that the deaths of people like me from COVID-19 matter in a world where, you know, nearly 50% of the people who are killed by police are people with disabilities like mine, even as my whiteness shelters me from the worst impacts of that. So I would say, you know, achievable, perhaps an economic recovery that works for working Pennsylvanians, the bigger lift, a Harrisburg that works for everybody even people as marginalized as I am and more marginalized than I am. Jessica, thank you so much. And thank you all so much for this discussion, inspiring things. Um, if you in the audience wanna find out more about these candidates, just go to their websites. There's all kinds of great things there. I did it myself and I, I was reading for hours and, and, and soaking in every little bit of it. So it's been a pleasure tonight. Uh, Christine, let's send it back to you. Cute. There. I was going to show a few final slides, but I can't think of anything better than to continue to look at all of you. Um, I hope you're all inspired. I hope you understand why we support these candidates. I want to thank the candidates so much. It, it, you reminded me of why we do the work that we do. You know, there are people who, there's an old saying in politics that some people run for office to be somebody and some people run for office to do something. And I think we all had the pleasure of listening to a number of women who want to do something. You know, the other day, Nora D O'Donnell asked, um, uh, Senator Harris in the in the 60 minutes she said well if you're going to run as a progress you know is what is your platform and what do you bring as a progressive she goes I don't bring something as a progressive I bring something as a, a as a black woman in who grew up in Oakland I bring something as a child of a, an Indian immigrant I bring something as a former attorney general I bring something as a DA and she goes that's what I bring. And, and listening to all of you reminded me of all that you're gonna to bring to Harrisburg and why we need you and why we need change. And um, following on what Senator Schwenk said, nothing happens without taking the majority. It's just the way it is in both the House and the Senate and we can do it. And so the last mo comment is go work for these candidates, whatever else you need to do to get out the vote. The most important thing we can do is vote and vote 
up, you know, all the way down the ticket, every every house, every seat. I had a chat with somebody today on the PA Dems voter hotline who said she usually only votes for president. And she was telling me how tough it is for her daughter and her son who have minimum wage jobs. And I said, well, <clears throat> you do know that minimum wage could be changed if, you, if we flip the legislature. And I had a civics lesson with her in the middle of her hotline call. But these are so important for all of us. And it's and the work you're all doing and how hard you're working. I'm so impressed. And I thank you for all you're doing. And one more week. Thank you very much uh, to our moderator. You did a great job and to Heidi for organizing these things. Take care, everybody.